let me, let me, we're, I think it'll be fun to go to a theme. Right? If we follow Proclus, um, we'll see that he's not a Platonist, but he is a Neoplatonist. You didn't say Proclus, you didn't say Platonist. You just, you just said Proclus. Did you mean to say Platonus? Uh, what do you think? I think you meant to say Platonus, but uh, I could be wrong because I've been wrong before. Oh. That's, that's, where, that's where we may be going. How about that? To oh, show yeah. what? Proclus. Uh, what, what a trip. What a going to show that he's really a, he is a Neoplatonist in respect to his metaphysics, but in terms of his psychology, he's a Stoic. Look, look what he's thinking again. Got him. Good, good. So look here, the fun is we can either get to section three by going one, two, three, or jumping into three uh, right away. It uh, depends upon which way you guys want to go for it. I love doing it backwards. One, two, three? No. Three. 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 I love backwards. Let us now consider the human soul, which while in the body is subject to ills and suffering, a prey to griefs, lusts, fears, evils of every kind, whose body is a chain or a tomb in the realm of sense, a cave. That's stoicism? Or a, a grotto. That's, is that stoicism? I don't know. That it should be thus does not go counter to the preceding. preceding. It is simply that the causes of its descent are different. So what are we going to go for? The causes of its descent. <clears throat> certainly not just certainly not stoic. To begin with, the intelligence dwells entire within that region of thought we call the intelligible realm. Yet it comprises within itself a variety of intellective powers and particular intelligences. The intelligence is not merely one, it is one and many. In the same way is there both soul and many souls, for the one soul proceeds, pro proceeds a multiplicity of different souls, as from one and the same genus proceed species of various ranks, some of which are more rational than others, less rational in form. So he's basically, he's got so far an analogy, doesn't it? Right. Basically, two levels. Again, in the intelligible realm, there is intelligence, which, like some huge organism, contains potentially all other intelligences. And they are the individual intelligences, each of them an actuality. Analogy. Think of a city uh, as having a soul. It would include inhabitants, each of whom would have a soul. 
it would include inhabitants, each of whom would have a soul. The soul of the city would be the more perfect and the more powerful, which would prevent the souls of the inhabitants from being of the same nature as the soul of the city, nothing. Or again, take fire, the universal form which precedes a large and small particular fires. All of them have a common essence, that of universal fire. Or rather, all partake of that essence which precedes universal fire. So what is he doing? He's creating an analogy similar to this. As the city is one, and its inhabitants or citizens are many. So he's got this analogy, and then he's this basic two, two sets of terms, and then he explores it further in terms of the city and its inhabitants claiming the same thing is true for soul as for intelligence. So therefore he has to make it look here. Since they're so similar, he has to find a difference, and this is where he goes. The function of the soul is intellective, is intellection. But it's not limited to intellection. If it were, there'd be no distinction between it and the intelligence. It has functions besides the intellectual, and these, by which it is not simply intelligence, determine its distinctive existence. In directing itself to what is above itself, it thinks. In directing itself to itself, it preserves itself. In directing itself to what is lower than itself, it orders, administrates, and governs. The reason, the reason for such an existence of the soul is that the totality of things cannot continue limited to the intelligible so long as a succession of further existence is possible. Although less perfect, they necessarily are because of the prior existence necessarily is. So what are you required to do now? You're going to take intelligence and spell out everything he says about it, and then you go back and now make the contrast. You can then see the contrast without doing any work, or very little work. Now recall that when we're talking about this guy, when he's talking about intelligence, he always means intelligence hyphen being. And the way it is experienced is divine luminosity. Hey, you know, intelligence, part of it is seeking its cause, which would be the good of the one. Part directed at itself, and part then directed to what it generates which is soul. <coughs> so therefore, you line up the things he talks about in here, then you jump here, and you can then see the difference. <coughs> like the function of the soul, function of the soul, see, since it penetrates, <coughs> see for uh, Plotinus, this shows a participation, but in other places he, he talks about participation and the better model would be this one.
from. It's it's so it's nearly superimposed on the whole of it. This shows there's only a, a, a level of participation, but for him, <clears throat> uh, it's much more like this. So here it permeates, where this you have to reach to it. Yeah, he said, there's only a small jump for the soul. It's once you get onto my system, he says, you'll see that there's just a short jump for you to make. Here, all your energies would be at that part. In other systems, there's a gap. So you'd have to jump, a leap, no, no participation. So his is very tight, close. So, it, so that's why the soul's function is intellectual. But it's not limited, right? But it's not limited to intellection. If it were, there'd be no distinction between it and the intelligence. Okay, now we get what? The difference. So here it is. And intelligence has other functions. It's not simply intelligence. I'll tell you, it's distinctive uh, existence, he says, in directing itself to what is above itself. That's this, right? It thinks, of course, that should be noetic, right? Noose. It's not thinking here. This is thinking. Uh, this is noosing, right? Intellecting. In directing itself to what is above it, thinks. In directing itself to itself, right? In doing this, in that act, it preserves itself. This returns to this is therefore a return to one's source. This preserves itself. This turning and turning and taking care of itself is just directing itself to itself. And directing itself to what is lower than itself, <whistles> realm of the soul, it orders, administrates, governs, right? Hey, the reason uh, such an existence of the soul is that the totality of things cannot continue limited to the intelligible so long as there's a further level of existence. Therefore, there's something else the soul must do. You see? The soul, too, must do something. And when it, same levels, if it directs itself to what is higher, ah, then it's intellect then. When it concerns itself or itself, it's preserving its existence. When it now directs, the soul directs itself to what is in its realm, it orders, administrates, and governs on another level. So, so now we're going to go for this. Now. All right? He's now moving here. Now he's going to explain this is where we're going. Okay, because now we're into section four. Oh, I thought we were going to two. Pardon? Mm -hmm. I thought we were going to two. Pardon? She, she thought you were going backwards. Yeah, we're going to go backwards, but I thought I'd do three and four first. Mm -hmm. Thus, individual souls are possessed by a desire for the intelligible. Right, from whence it came. And they possess too a power over the realm of sense, much in the way that sunshine, although attached to the sun above, does not deny its rays to what is below. If the soul remain 
if, if the souls remain in the intelligible realm of the soul, they're beyond harm and share in the soul's governance. They're like kings who live with the high king and govern with him, and like him, they do not come down from the palace. So, for some souls, you say, hey, you know what? Some that land here can stay here. Thus far, all are in one same place. But there comes a point at which they come down from this state. Ah, see, to center the soul. Cosmic in its dimensions to one of individuality. They, right, now, he's now giving the reason for incarnation return, soul's return, Tibetan Book of the Dead, Plato's Phaedo. They wish to be independent. They're tired, tired, you might say, of living with someone else. <laughs> Each steps down into its own individuality. When a soul remains for a long, for a long in this withdrawal, an estrangement from the whole, with never a glance towards the intelligible, uh, becomes a thing fragmented, isolated, weak. You know what? Activity lacks concentration. Attention is tied to particulars, severed, severed from the whole, the soul clings to the part to this one soul thing buffeted about by a whole world full of things as it turned and given itself. Adrift now from the whole, it managed even this particular thing with difficulty, its care of its com compelling attraction to externals, presence to the body, deep penetration <clears throat> of the body. Well, you know what this is called? Loss of wings, chaining of the soul. It's no longer, it's no longer are the ways of innocence in which with the soul it presided over the higher realms. Life above was better by far than this, a thing fallen, chained, at first barred off from intelligence and living only by sensation. The soul, as they say, in its own tavern. Yet its higher part remains. <clears throat> but the soul, taking its lead from memory, merely think on essential being and its shackles are loosed and <laughs> it soars. Souls of necessity lead a double life, you see, partly in the intelligible realm and partly in the intelligible realm and partly in that of sense. The higher life dominant and those able to communicate more continuously with the intelligence, the lower dominant, where character or circumstance are less favorable. Now, this is pretty much what Plato indicates into distinguishing those of the second mixing bowl. After they've been dipped in this way, they uh, must, he says, be born. Uh, when he speaks of divinity, sowing seeds, he's to be understood as the way he has divinity, giving orations and speeches. He describes of things contained in the universe as begotten, created. Uh, that's what he does. Okay, what would you say, therefore, is this? Okay. How do these souls come back? Come on. Think, Got it? That's a yada, think, yada, 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 yada. Being. <laughs> think on essential being. There. Sounds like Dante stole that idea, didn't he? No, 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 no. See, you first have to account for this.
And the reason you've chosen? Individuality. Mm -hmm. Right? Look at that. There it is. Look. I heard of living with <laughs> Fragmented, isolated, weak. Activity lacks concentration. That's a major point with him, you know. Activity lacks concentration. <laughs> Sometimes he calls it contemplation, not just not just attention. It's a, it's a um, you know, when you ask someone at school, you know, like, hey, you're in college? Uh-huh. Uh, a freshman? Uh-huh. Well, what are you going to do for the next couple of years? I'm going to stay in college. Oh. Oh. What for? I'm going to get a degree. Then what? Well, then I should be able to get a job. Oh. Then maybe get another degree, get a better job. Oh. Oh. So he's got an idea, and as long as he focuses on that idea, he can then work, dedicate, dedicate himself, right? Then you can say, by the way, what happens, what do you think might happen if all the work you're putting in college for that job no longer exists when you get your degree? As well, then I got the wrong education. I, maybe I should have done something else. But see, oh, the reason you're doing it is you think because after you get the job, you'll be happy, uh huh, uh huh, and have a foreign car, uh huh. So, what's he doing? It's this object of contemplation. So, he says, You know the trouble with this kid? See? All of his activities for years is being guided by a contemplation. And what he really wants is a state of happiness, doesn't he? He said, therefore, people too weak for contemplation spend their life in activity, focusing on an idea which they're then dedicated to. Therefore, he says, activity is a weak contemplation. Is that clever? All right, okay, then we can go on. Well, the well isn't that also a, a reinforcement of his ideas about the realm of sense, that we're chained to our senses? More. more. In, in the sense that thinking that what comes through the sensorium has importance or relevance of some kind. And like your student who is, you know, going to get a degree to get a job to get money to be happy, that is all based upon ideas from the sensorium oh, sure. of the material world. Oh, yeah. That's the goal. And if Plato's right, those are shadows, not real. Oh, yeah. yeah pure, pure, okay. Use the, use the story to That's right. Right. <coughs> But... But when you're doing that, he says that's a that's a, that's a weak contemplation. Well, but but Therefore, I'm just saying pull out of that it's, it's reinforced by yeah. thinking that only our eyes and and hmm. senses of the material body are anything worth paying attention to. I go for him. Okay, that's right. All yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Therefore, we can go to one and two, can't we? Hold it, the gentleman. You, you, you use this example. To what, what? You use this example of, I did. of the student. Stay there. To illustrate, to illustrate the, the idea that activity lacks concentration or contemplation. Contemplation. Okay. Usually he calls it contemplation. Here he calls it attention. Yeah. yeah go ahead. All right. I'll tell you what. I won't ask you to... I, I won't ask you to uh, do it again. Okay. Thank you. So I just won't do that. <laughs> no, come on. What's the, I'll do it again if you want. Will you? Okay. By the way, um, did you go to college? By golly, I did. 
Oh, what drove you to go again and again, day after day, for how many years? Uh, well, at first, uh, I don't know. It was a thing to do. Okay, it was a thing to do. So that was enough to drive you. It was the thing to do. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that was pretty much it. Yeah, okay, then that idea, it's the thing to do, right? And because in thinking that that's the thing to do, I imagine you thought you would be worse off, better off, or indifferent. You know, I had, I had some sort of information of of well, then you're a perfect case of the person who doesn't even have an object of contemplation. You just went along with a ride. That's what I was, sure. Yeah, yeah. By the way, knowing what you know now, would you have changed any part of it? Oh, yeah. What? Well, taking it more seriously from the beginning. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So his, his point would be, had you engaged yourself in that kind of reflection earlier, it may have changed your life. Agree? Yeah. Is that likely or not? Yeah, that, that's true in my case. With you, you Sometimes they call that kind of reflection contemplation. Oh, okay. Therefore, he concludes that people engaged in activity, work, is a poor contemplation. Activity, work. Well, that makes it clear. When you say oh. activity, work. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay, would you agree we need a reader, don't we? Brad, who would you recommend? Okay, all right. Uh, I have yeah, translation. Thank you. Are we going to back now into one? To one? We start from the beginning now? Okay. <clears throat> it's a great line that begins this, isn't it? Yeah, it has happened often. Yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Roused into myself from my body, outside everything else, and inside myself. My gaze has met a beauty wondrous and great. At such moments I have been certain that mine was the better part. Mine the best of lies lived to the fullest. Mine identity with the divine. Fixed there firmly, poised above everything in the intellectual that is less than the highest. Utter actuality was mine. Mm -hmm. But then there has come the descent. The descent. Down from intellection to the discourse of reason. And it leaves me puzzled. Why this descent? Indeed, why did my soul ever enter my body since even when in the body, it remains what it has shown itself to be when by itself? You see, okay, here I am. I've come down into a body. How come? I was up here having a ball. No, go ahead. But it's even worse than that, right? Because that last thing that he points out is that when he says, uh, why did my soul ever enter the body since even when in the body, no. it remains what it has shown itself to be when it's by itself. Heraclitus, who urges the study of this matter, says that contraries necessarily change into each other. But talking of the way up and the way down, asserting that change is repose, that to make the same effort and to obey is a wearisome business, he engages in metaphor and is little concerned with explaining himself, feeling perhaps that we should seek out the answers for ourselves as he did for himself. Empedocles, for his part, says it is ordained that souls at fault descend into this world, that he himself was fugitive from the divine to mad discourse, to mad discord and slavery. But he is, I fear, no more revealing than Pythagoras. His interpreters here, as elsewhere, find allegory. What is more, he speaks as a poet, and that adds to the obscurity. But then there is the divine Plato, who has had so much that is beautiful to say in the soul. In the dialogues, he frequently, he frequently treats of the soul's arrival in this world, and awakens hope that here will be clarity. Unfortunately, consistency is not a strong point, 
so it is not easy to catch his meaning. However, everywhere he holds the bodily in low esteem, he deplores the association of soul with body. He says that the soul is enchained and entombed by the body. He considers high doctrine with challenging implications, the assertion of the mystery religions, that the soul, when here, below, is in a prison. What he calls the cave seems to me like the grotto of Empedocles to signify the realm of sense. Because for the soul to break its chains and ascend from it, its cave is, he says, to rise to the intelligible realm. In the Phaedrus, the loss of its wings is causing the soul's descent. Periodically recurring cycles bring the soul back down here after it has gone aloft. Judgments, loss, chance, and necessity drive other souls down into this world. In all these it's instances, Plato deplores the association of soul with body. Yet, treating of the sense world of the Timaeus, he praises it and calls it a blessed God and contends the soul was given it by the goodness of the Demiurge so that the sum of things might be possessed. <coughs> intelligence, which without the soul, it could not be. The soul of each of us is dispatched hither for the same reason. If the realm of sense is to be complete, it is necessary that it contain as many kinds of living beings as does the intelligent world. So we should now be able to see the way he writes, we can now chart exactly each phase in our diagram, but no. Pull it together, why the descent? Continue on. Or you would say, sir. You're pulling it together now. Said pull it together. Why the descent? Yeah, see, yes, why the descent? That's the kind of We've got to pull that out of the section. Why the descent? Why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> to seek <laughs> individuality. That's what, we, that's what we discovered in both of these secondary levels. So Need a good quote so that the sum of things might be possessed of intelligence. That's a book. Which without the soul, it cannot be. So whatever, is, whatever is generated here, this has to be a mirror image. The same functions in the one is going to take place in the other on a diminished level of and therefore, for it to be analogous, so each part must be said to be here as well as here. He could equally have said the same question here. Why did it follow that given the good and the one that there ever would be an intelligence? You can always ask the same question because this is an analogical system, hierarchically arranged. So to be complete, to be complete, there had to be a further level of existence. And one of the questions that we're going to explore with this dude is why does the process end? See, why doesn't it keep on going? Downward? Yeah, it has to con just continue going. And if not, why not? But given now what you were just reading, yeah. He also said, about, correct me if I'm wrong, the underlying necessity is completeness. Pardon me, do it again. I believe you also stated that the underlying necessity is completeness. Yes. My question is why is completeness even oh, okay. required? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or maybe put another way, why not just the one? 
same, you can ask the same question all the way up and down. No. Um, said, did you hear that story about the uh, two guys that were judged by uh, 3,851 women to be perfect? No. No, no. No, the women looked over these two guys and they happened to be twins. And in every respect they were perfect. Until one of them was more curious than the other 3,851. And uh, <clears throat> she took another look and she said, oh my God, one of them doesn't have any balls. So she chose that one to be more perfect. Do you think she made a mistake? Yes. Well, I'm not a woman. <laughs> well, do you need procreation or not? <laughs> Does it continue to procreate or not? So she chooses a non procreate Or you can take the same story yeah. with twin women, and there were 6,853 <laughs> men looked upon them as perfect, and they were twins. And one was sterile. So it comes back to the same thing. The other Completeness. could produce. Would you say, therefore, there was no significant difference between the two? Not for some things. Oh, I didn't say that. Like, what is, what is, in, what is incomplete? The premise here is, if complete, there should be the power to generate. Mm -hmm. If not, you're talking about an impotent God or an impotent intelligence all the way down the line. So birthing, birthing is a mark of perfection in this system. So then by extension, yes. the descent would stop when you reach the level where there is no... That's right, and then you have to understand that. That's right. That's absolutely right. Yeah, see if I agree with myself. <laughs> mm. no. See, that's why we're going to have to raise that question. Why, why does it stop here? That's right. No. Okay. Okay. All right. Two. Uh, sir, would you like to gain that sure. distinction and charge ahead with us? So, seeking in Plato an answer to questions about one thing. Oh, by the way, uh, that last sentence, that last phrase, it is necessary that it contain as many kinds of living beings as does the intelligible realm. Uh, when you go back and look at the Timaeus, by the way, check uh, 30D. Okay. See whether he's right about that. But later. Okay, go ahead. So, seeking in Plato an answer to questions about one's own soul, one was driven to questions about soul in general. How, is, how has soul been brought into association with, with body? And what sort is the world in which soul freely or necessarily or in any other way lives? Did the demiurge do right in making this world? Or as or, or as our souls do? Not a sentence. It was seen that our souls charged the managing of bodies less perfect than they had to penetrate into them as they were to manage them truly. For such bodies have a tendency to come apart, the parts starting to return to their natural places since everything in the cosmos has its natural place. More than that, such bodies require a knowing management that is both extensive and detailed because they are forever exposed <coughs> to the assaults of alien bodies, are forever oppressed by wants, and the <coughs> unremitting and the multiple adversities that beset them. The body of the soul, on the other hand, is perfect. It is complete, it is self-sufficient, it is not subject to influences that prevent it expressing its own nature. Louder. <coughs> It is not subject to influences that prevent, prevent its expressing its own nature. It requires, accordingly, only a light control. That's why the soul remains free of care and molestations, its native disposition intact. Nothing going out, nothing coming in. Hence, <clears throat> Plato says that the human soul 
what it is with, with this perfect one becomes perfect, ex perfect itself and journeys on high and controls the whole world. <clears throat> and so long as it does not withdraw to enter a body, to be attached to something individual, exercises of control is effortless as that of the soul. That it gives body existence is not nece necessarily to the soul of hurt, <clears throat> providing for a lower nature does not necessarily prevent the agency that exercises it from remaining itself in a state of perfection. Providence is of two kinds. It is directed, it is directed to the whole, and it regulates everything after the fashion of kings giving orders to be executed by others. Or, it is involved with detail and operates directly, adapting agent and acted upon one to the other. The soul divine administer the soul divine administers the heavens in the first way, transcending them in its highest phases and imminent to them solely in its lowest. <clears throat> One cannot accordingly accuse divinity of having assigned an inferior an inferior place to the soul. It has never been deprived of its native status. This operation, which is not counter to its nature, is always possessed and always will. The saying that the relation of the souls of the stars to their bodies is the same as that of the soul of the world to, to the world, since these starry bodies are encompassed in the circuit of the soul, Plato also accords the stars their appropriate happiness. <clears throat> Of the two objections against the interaction of soul and body, that it hinders the soul's intellective act and that it fills the soul with pleasure, lust, fear, neither holds here. The soul has not penetrated deeply into the body and is not dependent on the particular. Body is for it and not it. Okay, look, can we body. break it into two, th two pieces? But when he uses the word soul, when it's a capital soul, S, that's world soul. Small s, human soul, individual souls. Then he needs to talk about providence, right? a separate subject, right? So we now just want to see how he describes what happens to the soul as it enters the body. That's our task. What does it do? We saw what happens to intelligence when it enters. Now we want to see what happens the soul enters the body. So pull it, pull it out from there. Then we can... Yes. Right? Look at the language he uses. <clears throat> the soul is charged with managing of bodies less perfect than they. It had to penetrate into them going to truly manage them. Bodies require a knowing management, extensive, detailed, because they're forever exposed to the assaults of alien bodies, uh, uh, are forever oppressed by wants, they need help unremittingly, in the multitude adversities that beset them. Right? That's all small s, large s, world soul, right? Perfect, complete, self-sufficient, right? Take a look at all the qualities, right? Then he jumps back to the soul. Now I'm about 10 lines down on 64. Oh, 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 then gives <clears throat> body existence is not necessarily to the soul's hurt, providing for a lower nature does not necessarily prevent the agency that exercises it from remaining itself in the state of, in a state of perfection. Therefore, providence is of two kinds. Jump in. It is 
directed to the whole and regulates everything after the fashion of kings, giving orders to be executed by others, or is involved with detail and operates directly, adapting agent and acting upon one to the other. A soul, divine, administers the heaven in the first way, transcending them in its highest phases and imminent to them solely in its lowest. One cannot accordingly accuse <clears throat> one cannot accordingly accuse divinity of having assigned an inferior place to the soul. It has never been deprived of its native states. This operation, which is not accounting to its nature, is always possessed and always will. Always will be. <clears throat> So your task is to finish out the analogy. Right, two aspects to providence. You got the two of them. One goes to soul with a capital S, world soul. And the second function goes to soul with a small s of the human soul. Got it? Take a look. Note it. Don't lose it. of course is very significant because then he's going to talk about how these two souls, two kinds of souls are related to the heavens and stars. Right? Which is astrology. So with the two aspects of providence, one transcending and the other imminent, assigns one to each. And saying that the relation of the souls to the stars, to their bodies, is the same as that of the soul of the world to the world, since these starry bodies are encompassed in the circuit of the soul. Uh, Plato also accords the stars their appropriate happiness. Of the two objections against the interaction of soul and body, that it hinders the soul's intellective part and that it fills the soul with pleasure, lust, fear, neither holds here, not with a capital S soul. The soul has not penetrated deeply into the body. It's not, not dependent on the particular body. Is for it, not it for the body. Its body lacks nothing, wants nothing. Hence, the soul is free from both desires and fears. Since the starry body is, is what it is, the soul has no cause for disturbance on its account. <clears throat> nothing intrudes upon its repose. <coughs> Nothing intrudes upon its repose and makes it inclined downward, robbing it of the high happiness of contemplation. Now, this whole thing is dependent on the time is, right, from 28 on, right? And uh, if we don't have that, <coughs> it's difficult to see what he's doing. Uh, 
Where could you bring a copy of the chime in with you? Uh, no. Huh? No. Yes, you do. I should have. Did you? Yes, you do. Just here. But it's, it's, it's in the back of the book. Let's go to uh, 202, 203. Yep. Two oh two. Page two oh two. That's the time is sections on the time is. Yeah. Two oh two is about two oh one. Ah, there it is. Yeah. Now the part that he's talking he's talking about it in two ways. One on page 203, another on page 24, 204. starts with this. So he starts with this. Now, notice the three things it can do. Intelligence. It seeks its higher. It could itself with the one. It has a force of preserving itself. And it also extends itself into the realm of soul so that it orders, administrates, and governs the soul, especially capital S. Now, what is this that it's doing? See, it's turning upon itself. Okay, that's what this is. It's turning upon itself. That's this motion. That's Usir. That's the magic word. And he says this is both one and many. Because in the experience of divine luminosity, you can make distinctions. Right? You can say, hey, you know what? That's real. That's what really is. Ah, being. Really is. Oh, it's not dead. Wow, it's got one heck of a vitality. Oh. Hey, man, you know what? In that state, that's that, that divine luminosity is nothing other than pure mind. Look here, you're making distinctions even though there are no differences. Right? So it's one in many. So what? Well, when he creates the world soul, he's taking Usia, which is indivisible. Right? Uh, impossible to break into parts and the kind of Usia that is within us, which is partable. So this is partable, partable Usia. This is impartable. Two kinds of Usia. He says, you know what? You gotta mix these two. He says, that's a hell of a task. What you need to do to mix these two is, is uh, you need something to mix it. And you mix it with pure being. You mix it in a bowl. Right, 
So you mix this, see? And then you dole it out. You take one portion, then double it, and then double it, and double it, and then even an odd. So you have successively uh, mean analogies, right? One, two, four, two, four, eight, one, three, nine, three, nine, twenty-seven. These are all mean analogies. Okay, this is now the soul. This is the world soul. Is not you know what you do with that? You spread it all, just all over the universe. So there's no part of the universe that isn't alive. Where, wherever any space is, it ain't nothing. It has to be soul. So what? Because if he's going to have planets or stars, he has to say they're alive. Well, now he can do it because throughout all of space there is soul, soul, soul. world soul. Mm -hmm. so. Therefore, he can take these two and band them together. And therefore, in that band, he, this is a, in motion. And that is the world, the whole universe spinning around. And therefore, along the one, you can put the position of the heavens, this planetary stars. Therefore, you have a, a, a living planetary system which has the very possibility, inherent possibility of turning upon itself because that's the very nature of the universe. So what he does is he takes these high qualities here, intelligence, takes the aspect of turning it upon itself, Lucia, he says that's the stuff of which everything is made of. Because of anything that has any vitality or life, it's made of one of these mixtures. Okay, take a look at 202, 204. Out of the invisible and unchangeable, that's the unchangeable, impartable Lucia, and also, out of that which is divisible and has to do with material bodies, he composed a third, an intermediate kind of essence, partaking the nature of the same and the other. This is impartable, same. This now he calls other, same and other. And this compound he placed accordingly in a mean, between the invisible and divisible material. Now, when the Creator had framed the soul according to His will, He formed within her the corporeal universe. So you get it? Within this, you frame the corporeal universe and brought the, the two together united, them center to center. The soul interfused everywhere from the center to the circumference of heaven, of which also she is the external envelopment, herself, herself turning in herself. See the same Lucia-like movement. And began a divine beginning of never ceasing and rational life enduring throughout all time. And the Father and Creator saw the creature which he had made moving and living, the created image of the eternal gods, he rejoiced and in his joy determined to make the copy still more like the original. And as this was eternal, he sought to make the universe eternal as far as it might be. Now the nature of the ideal being was everlasting, but to bestow this attribute to the fullness upon the creature was impossible. Wherefore, he resolved to have a moving image of eternity. And when he set in order the heavens, he made this image eternal, but moving according to number, while eternity itself rests in unity 
and this image we call A. Time. The preceding number is 34C. Therefore, he left out D and E, etc. So these are selections. Well, and, oh, I see. So yes, therefore, when you go back and look at it in the whole, you'll see there's much more interesting details, especially that great line where it says, thus he created the universe as a living God, since it, therefore it's, it, it has that unceasing quality of time, unceasing. Therefore, it's the image of a God. Right? He created an image of the eternal gods by creating the universe. No beginning, no end, unceasing. Those rip off plagiarist Christians. Fuck them. Pardon, sir? I said those rip off plagiarist Christians. Yes. Fuck them. Uh, everything oh, is based yeah. off of this. Oh, yeah. They ha everything just comes out of this. Yeah. yeah. Plagiarist. Well, yeah, but it has to. It has to start here. No matter where we take it, it comes out of this. That we see it comes time and time again. We bounce right through that. Yeah, see, his metaphysics comes time. out of his metaphysics comes out of this this experience. Fact is one has that well, experience. Well, you have no idea what that just did to my head. Yeah. Right. So he then says there are two kinds. See, same and other, impartable, partible. But so we can make divisions, but they're not differences. Yeah, you know, like mm -hmm. top and bottom, that's not a difference, it's a distinction. It's a distinction, right? distinction that There's the same. parts I can take apart. How can partible interface with impartible, since impartible cannot be partible? That's right. That's but why he said you need there. a third thing to mix them, thing. and he uses essence, according to this translation. Okay. Other translations use the word the being. Wand waving here. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So that's why you need a third thing to mix them because you can never oh, mix okay. two things without a third. There's a triad that we've been looking for. That's the tri that's a fundamental triad, triad I was looking yeah. for right yeah. there. Right, right, right. Oh, yeah. Jumped every one, but here it comes yeah. together. Yeah. Hmm. So most of most of his metaphysics comes out of the time errors. Builds out of the time errors. So that's why it's worthwhile just getting a quick look from at least 28 to 36, 35. Mm -hmm. It's very beautiful. Um, he does have one nice part of it, by the way, um, much to his credit. <clears throat> Let me tell you then why the Creator made the world of generation. He was good. And the good can never have any jealousy of anything. And being free from jealousy, he desired that all things should be as like himself as they could be. This is the truest, uh, this is in the truest sense the origin of creation and of the world as we shall do well in believing on the testimony of wise men. God desired that all things should be good and nothing bad. So as far as this was attainable, therefore also finding the whole visible sphere not at rest, but moving in irregularly, disorderly fashion. Out of disorder he brought order. Considering that in every way it's better than the other. Now the deeds of the, of, of the best could never be or have been other than the most beautiful. And the Creator, reflecting on the things which are by nature visible, found that no unintelligent creature taken as a whole was more beautiful than the intelligent taken as a whole. And that intelligence could not be present in anything that was devoid of soul. For this reason, when he was framing the universe, he put intelligence in soul and soul and body that it might be the creator of a work that was by its very nature beautiful and best. Therefore, using the language of probability, we must say that the world became a living creature truly endowed with soul and intelligence by the providence of God. Nice. Nice paragraph. Mm -hmm. So the supreme originating principle of the universe is likeness. Is that right? Probably. If it is a, 
if it is a model copy, oh, yeah. if it's a model copy, it presupposes there must be likeness. If you outlawed likeness, you couldn't have the property of, pro of model to copy, could it? No. Therefore, a mean analogy and likeness must pre-exist before the universe. No, no. Would it be too much of a stretch to say that As love is something a part of the Pardon, do it again? Would it be too much of a stretch to say that love no. played a part of that? Well, uh, what is it that he's doing? See, he's a creator, and he's looking at this to make it most beautiful and best. And so far as I know, anybody engaged in that activity is, is inspired by some kind of love. But if you're asking whether he ex explicitly says that, no. Might you infer it? Take a look and let me know. Yeah. This is all about death. So, Pierre. Howdy. So, this demiurge sees that there's a universe already existing. It's not a creator like. It no, it's made. not a creator. Right, so. Out of nothing. No, that's not part of this world. No. So, there already is a world of the body that exists. Disordered. Disordered body. Yeah, he brought it into order. Is it a body? Mm -hmm. And gave it a body because it's no it's fragmented, no body. No body, just disorder, no. a state. As long as we're talking about body in the sense of bodies such as animals have bodies, not just material things. Or form. Well, because if you're talking about animals or any kind of living thing, you're talking about an organization of material in such a way that it can be can have the capacity to move, act, think, judge. And that already means there's some intellectual process going on. It's not random, it, indiscriminate objects without such a thing. Okay. So it didn't have soul. And this so he made that. He yeah. made soul, he made body yeah. for that. So the stuff, the material, as it were, is disordered. And he brings into existence soul and then brings those things together into unities and puts them in place. Okay. So this is a question we asked at the solstice party. Mm -hmm. Why carnation? Pardon? The first incarnation. Yes, why the first? Yeah, yeah. Same reason. That's the same issue, see? Uh, you know that great line of St. Augustine when the monk asked him, hey, what was God doing before he created the universe? He said, creating a hell for guys like you asked that question. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it gets down to, if something is perfect, should it then have the capacity and the ability to reproduce? And therefore, if there is a good and perfect, it would naturally follow that there should be some creation. So for the Greek world, creation is a mark of, of perfection. And it wouldn't be done without the beauty. No. I need a cup of coffee. So, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, at your dress, at your look.